Okay, um, we started covering JavaScript last time, and we talked about uh, JavaScript's role in the development of web pages. And can anyone summarize the role of JavaScript in web pages based on the example that we saw on ESPN and based on what we've talked about in class? It makes web pages dynamic. Makes web pages dynamic. Um, that's a good way to say it. Helps to. I would I would choose the word interactive instead okay. of dynamic, but either one of those words is is okay. Um, does anyone want to add to that? Right. It it makes changes to an existing web page. All right, to make it interactive or to make it dynamic. Uh, and it does so without having to use the server's resources. So it can all be done on the client and not done on the server. And the big advantage of that is even on a fast internet connection, for my machine to make a request to the server, for it to be routed through the internet, get to the server, for the server to deal with it and respond to it still takes some time. It may be fast as far as like on a human scale of time goes, but on the computer scale of time, that's a long time for information to be transferred from the client to the server, the server to do its thing and get a response. Whereas things that happen on the client, the code that executes there can execute virtually instantaneously. So we can make small changes. We can be interactive. What I mean by interactive is that you do something and the page responds. All right? Um, it can do that without requiring the server's resources to be used. All right? Along with the basic page that contains basic HTML and basic CSS, <coughs> it contains also the JavaScript to do these interactive changes and to do these things. So the first example we went over was a spoiler example. And let's look at it and let's try to make some general conclusions. I'll, I'll zoom it up a little bigger. We have show and hide the spoiler. So it's kind of hard to tell all right, but the page isn't being reloaded. Our page is just local in this case. We're not using a web server, but even if we were using a web server, it wouldn't be bothering the web server. We're not reloading the page. We, this code is simply executing instantaneously because that code is contained as part of the page. So this doesn't require like the page to reload or anything like that. Let's look at this example. And then we'll try to come to some general conclusions about how most JavaScript works. All right? Can't say all, right? You can't say all about anything, really. But we can make some general statements about how most JavaScript uh, interactivity works. First of all, notice in this case that everything is included in this uh, HTML document. Now, it could be in separate files, so I could have put the CSS in its own file, all right? But I didn't. But even if I did, it would still be part of this document, right? Because the link to that file would be here. Likewise, I could actually put the JavaScript in its own file, but still it would be part of this page. So when this page is loaded, everything gets loaded. The HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript. The HTML supplies the content. So the content in this case is both the original question and the spoiler answer. So that is part of the HTML originally when that gets load, loaded. Just like we go to ESPN.com, All those extra menus that you don't see get loaded when the page loads. 
So all that HTML is there when the page loads. It's just hidden. And it's like that in our example too, although our example is much, on a much smaller scale. So everything, both the, the paragraph, the question, and the answer is loaded when the page is initially loaded. We use CSS to get the page the way we want it to look initially. So how do we want the page to look initially? Well, we want the question to appear, but not the answer. Just like in the case of ESPN's page, they want this menu to appear, this menu here to appear, and not these menus. So CSS is responsible for the appearance of the page. That's what CSS is always responsible for. So CSS is responsible for the way uh, that page appears. You can't make a, um, like a drop-down menu like that on Hover with CSS? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. There, there are a couple ways to do that. You could do a pure CSS menu as well. Uh, actually, and maybe they're even doing it. I'm just assuming that they're using JavaScript because it's a good example to talk about JavaScript. That, that's <coughs> a, an excellent point. Lastly, we have JavaScript that does the interactivity. And by interactivity, I mean when you do something the page somehow responds. <coughs> Thank you. There's sort of three parts of the interactivity. Number one is the user event that triggers it, triggers the ball to get rolling and to initiate some JavaScript. And again, assuming this would be done in JavaScript, the user event here is the on mouse over. In this case, the, the, the user event is the user clicking on the button. These are typically, these user events are typically designated by uh, event handlers on the HTML. And they typically start with the word on. And there will be, you know, many of the things that you would expect. Uh, in this case, we have on click on mouse over, on mouse out, on key up, on key down, and so on. I think we looked at a list of them last time, but we can look at a list again. It's all the main things that you would think of how people are going to interact with the, with the web page. And they give some common ones. On change, so an HTML element has been changed. On click, on mouse over, on mouse out, on key down. So that's sort of step one in the process. Let me create a new document here to put the steps. Step one. user does something on page HTML event handles it to respond. So in our case the user clicks on button and then our JavaScript runs. And that JavaScript is going to be to show the um, show the spoiler. Second thing that we have is we have what's called the document object model or DOM. That is the way that we refer to different things on the page. And if we look at this, we have a statement in the document object model here. So we have on click equals. So when the button is clicked, we execute this JavaScript statement. And it includes this DOM expression. And let's sort of break it down. 
Now there's all different kinds of DOM instructions and, and pieces of the DOM and so on. But what we're showing in this case is sort of a representative one, one that's pretty common. And that is the get element by ID instruction. All right. Notice we have document get element by ID. Sort of with each dot, this is called dot notation, with each dot down the line, we're zeroing in on something on the page that we want to change. So we're zooming in. Just like if we were talking about a place on Earth, we could say, well, it's on Earth. It's in North America. It's in the United States. It's in Ohio. It's in Lorain County. It's in Elyria. It's on Abbey Road in Elyria. It's Lorain County Community College. We're zeroing in so that we can specifically say exactly what we want. Here we're saying document get element by ID. Document means it's somewhere on the web page. All right. Document means it's somewhere on the web page. Now, you might say, well, where else could it be? It could be somewhere else. It could be on a pop-up page that pops up. So it's conceivable it could be something else. So document simply means, hey, on this page, there's something I'm looking for. Get element by ID is sort of a workhorse. You're going to use that a lot. And we're definitely going to use that a lot in my examples. That's not the only way that you can point to things on your page, but it's, it's a popular one. So document get element by ID means find the thing on the page that has this as its ID. And this is included in quotation marks. Generally speaking, something that's part of the instruction is not in quotation marks, whereas values of things like values of IDs and values of attributes will be in quotation marks. So in this case, this part of it says, find the thing on the page that has an ID of Luke Father. All right. Well, what is that? Well, if we look, there's one thing on the page that has an ID of Luke Father. And that's that paragraph right there. So we're now, with this instruction, with these two parts of the instructions, we're pointing at that paragraph. Now... Now that we're pointing at the paragraph, we're going to say what we want to do to it. We want to change something about the style of it. All right? Something that was set about the style of it. What about the, the, the style? We want to change its display attribute. Its display attribute. What do we want to set it to? We want to set it equal to block. So we're making, our code is making the change just as we could have gone in and typed in display equals block instead of display equals none. We're changing the exact same attribute. All right? So style is something in the CSS that we're changing. And everything is pretty much just the name that it has. So if the name is display in the style, it will be display in our JavaScript code. The only one exception to that is if, if our style code has a dash in it. There won't be a dash in our JavaScript. You remove the dash and make the second word <coughs> capitalize. So instead of background dash color, we'll have background color with a capital C. And we'll see an example of that in a minute here. All right. So that does that. Now, a couple things here. This sort of reinforces the importance that IDs have to be unique. Right? Because we want to write code that addresses and changes something specific on the page. So we can't have two things on the page named Luke Father Otherwise, it's not going to work right. So we want to make sure our IDs are unique. Secondly, of course, spelling is important. So if I spelled Luke Father and I made it Luke's Father with an S, it's not going to figure it out. All right? It has to be spelled exactly. What's more, 
It has to be correct as far as the case goes. JavaScript is case sensitive. So if I were to, to, you know, this instruction has to be written pretty much exactly like this. If I were to make this document get element by ID, and if I were to capitalize the D, it's not going to work. Doesn't work. Now, we'll talk about how you can troubleshoot that in a minute. But that's one of the biggest issues that people have when they first are starting JavaScript. They, they don't realize that the naming has to be very precise. So it has to match it exactly, and it also has to be case sensitive. How can you debug your JavaScript? Well, one of the things you can do is Different browsers have it in different places, but the Chrome browser has, we've looked at this before, more tools, developers tools, and if we look at the console, it will show us the error. And <clears throat> keep in mind that this is a computer program that's flagging this error. So it's not going to word the error in an in a easy, simple, understandable way. For example, what it says here is document get element ID is not a function. All right. That's all it says. Document get element by ID is not a function. It's sort of up to you to say, well, gee, I thought it was a function. You know, he lectured about it. And that's where you'd have to look and realize, well, the D would need to be lowercase. So it would need to be document get element by ID with a lowercase. And how do I clear this? Clear. <coughs> now if I run it and hit it again, it displays and I don't get any errors in my console. Now if I got the name of something wrong, it's going to give me a different error. Like if I said the ID was Luke's father instead of Luke father. It'd be nice if the error was like, K hey, it's not Luke's father, it's Luke father. But it's not going to give it to you that specifically. What it's going to tell you is, can't read property style of null. Let me translate that for you. We're asking for the style of what? We're asking for the style of the thing on the page that has an ID of Luke's father. It's telling us that that is null. In computer terms, that simply means that that doesn't exist. So what that is telling me is that there is nothing on this page that has an ID of Luke's father. All right? And this is where we say, wait a minute, I know there's something on the page that has an ID of Luke's father. And you double check, and you say, okay, actually, that's Luke's father. So you can then correct it and be back to working. It's important when you're debugging code like this that you don't simply look at your code, stare at it, and hope for the problem to jump out in your face. All right? Because that doesn't happen too often. It's good to have sort of a systematic way of looking at it. And the first thing that you can do to help trace the errors that you're having is to look at the console within JavaScript. And that will tell you what it, its definition of the error. And it sometimes takes a little bit of interpretation, but with a little bit of practice, you can sort of understand how you can translate what it says the error is into um, what, the actual, what the actual problem is so that you can fix it. All right. Hide spoiler the other way. Does the exact same thing except it sets the display back to none. So we can switch this guy back and forth. Show spoiler. Hide spoiler. Maybe. Show, hide, show, hide. All right. Let's look at the second example we went over. All 
all right? This is about the same as the first example, the difference being that we don't have a button. And we initiate the JavaScript with an on mouse over and an on mouse out event. And we initiate that on the paragraph. So when we put our mouse over the paragraph, it shows the spoiler. When we take our mouse off of the paragraph, it hides it. So works pretty much exactly the same. The rest of it works the same. The only difference being is we now have a different user event that initiates it. Show hide. This is getting to be closer to the menu example, right, where the mouse over makes something appear. It's your job when you're designing some sort of interactivity to decide what would work best, what is more logical, to have a button for it or to have a mouse over or, or what. So that's part of your job designing the interface is figuring out what user event you want to have uh, to initiate the JavaScript. Now, I mentioned before that we could change anything associated with the style simply by pointing to the element, <coughs> saying dot style, and then giving the style attribute. And in this case, we did it with visibility instead of um, display hidden or display none. I don't know why I did it with visibility uh, instead of that. Um, probably just to show you that you could do it two different ways. But again, if we're doing something in the style, we simply have the name style, and then we have the property written verbatim. The only exception is if there is a dash in the property name, we make it uppercase. The, the next letter. So for example, we could change this to yellow. And if we look at this, we are changing the background color. The style <coughs> attribute is background dash color. But in our JavaScript, we don't say background dash color. We say background color with the C, a capital C. Okay, we're now going to go and we're going to change HTML properties because CSS has properties, HTML code also has properties, and we can change those properties. Um, one of the things that is an example of something that has a property in HTML is an image. An image tag has a property of uh, the SRC property. That is what image. So what we're going to do is we're going to develop a little mini photo gallery where we have some thumbnails. And when you click on the thumbnail, or maybe when you mouse over the thumbnail, it's going to make one of the pictures bigger. All right. So I have some pictures here. Say that as gallery. And I actually have two versions of each image. I have the image name, and then I have the image name followed by a T. The T meaning thumbnail. A thumbnail is simply a smaller version of the image. So, for example, one image is a lion, one T is a smaller version of a lion. 
I wouldn't absolutely have to do this. I could resize it with my CSS, and I could make a smaller version of the big version by saying the CSS and giving a width in the CSS. The problem with that is I'm downloading, always downloading the bigger image. So if you had a whole bunch of images, you wouldn't necessarily want to always download the bigger version of the image and resize it via CSS. Um, you could instead only download the smaller version of the image and then only download the bigger image if the user chose that one. So if we have time, I don't know about today, but maybe Monday and next week, I'll do it the other way as well. But in this case, I already have the thumbnails, so I might as well use them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little gallery. All right. And I'm going to have, I hate to turn off the projector just to draw something for five minutes up here. Uh, I'm going to have going down on my web page, I'm going to have going down the side of my web page the thumbnails, and then I'm going to have the bigger picture alongside of it. So let's go and do that. I'm going to put the thumbnails in a unordered list because that's sort of what my thumbnails are. It's an unordered list of images. So I'm going to have UL, L, uh, and UL. Now keep in mind, I'm doing, I'm using the tags that make sense. If this doesn't look the way that I want it to, I will change it via CSS. Okay? So, remember, you always use the tags that best fit the situation. You don't gear it by, like, well, I want it to look like this, right? The HTML tags are about the content and the most appropriate way to show the content. If you want it to be displayed differently, you can change the way it's displayed via CSS. So, I'm going to put uh, this with three LIs in it. Image... SRC equals 1t.jpg. All equal thumbnail one. And I'll create my other two thumbnails. Then I'm going to put my big image here. Now, this isn't going to look exactly the way that I want it to look at first, but I'll put in some CSS to do that. Remember, my code here is going to be sort of like how I want the page to look like when the page initially loads. So when the page initially loads, I want the first, I want the, the three thumbnails and I want the bigger version of image one. So let's save this and look at it. And we'll see how it is, how it relates to how I want it to look. I open up gallery. All right. Kind of the way that I want it to look, but that image is underneath. And I want the image sort of be alongside here. All right, so there's a number of ways I could do this. I could do this. What I'm going to do is 
I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, I'm going to give an ID to this. And call it thumbnails. And I'm going to give an ID to this. <coughs> Big picture. And I'm going to say in my style, and again, I'm putting my style in the same file. Um, that's not a requirement. In fact, you usually wouldn't do that. I'm just in the interest of time, I'm keeping everything in one file to sort of simplify things a bit. So I'm going to say ID of thumbnail, so pound sign thumbnails with 20%. ID of big picture. other. Um, so I'm going to put a little bit of a margin. So I'm going to say next to the thumbnails, margin right of 10 pixels. And oh, by the way, any unordered list in the thumbnails, I'm going to get rid of the bullet points. I know that this is review, but I think it's important to always be reviewing the CSS that we've learned just to see different ways to use it. and drops down at some point, which is okay, and we can, we can deal with that later if we want to, all right? I could give a minimum width um, on that so it, it, it wouldn't get any smaller than a certain amount. So now what I want to have is I want some interactivity so that if I either put my mouse on a thumbnail or click on a thumbnail, it will change the picture. Now, what do you think would be better in this case? If I clicked on the thumbnail or if I put my mouse on it? Either is probably fine. I'm gonna I'm gonna do mouse over though. So I'm gonna change number two to say on mouse over. So I'm gonna put that on the thumbnail. So on the image, on mouse over equals. So I'm going to have my JavaScript statement there. What do you think?
think that JavaScript statement is going to look like? How's it going to start? Any thoughts? Well, it's a little bit of tweaking. We have to do the HTML page first. We have to give this guy an ID, right? Why do we have to give this guy an ID? We have to give this guy an ID because we want to point to it in a second here. So I'm going to say ID equals image swap. All right. So now I'm going to point to that image. How do I point to it? Document dot get element by ID I'm going to do single quotes and if you remind me I'll talk about the single quotes in a second. So now I'm pointing to this image because it is the image that has an ID of image img swap. So document get element by ID image swap. What attribute do I want to change for that? Do I want to change anything about the style of that attribute? Well, we could do it that way. We could make it invisible and show another image. But really, think of the image tag as being like a picture frame. And in a picture frame, you can put different pictures. You could just swap out what picture is here. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to change the visibility of it. I'm going to change the SRC attribute to put a different picture in there. So that's not an attribute of the style. That's an HTML attribute, right? It's part of the tag itself. So it's not part of the style. So I'm going to say dot .src equals, and then in single quotes again, I'm going to say 2jpg. Now, it's probably good for me to test this out because I'm going to clone this code in a minute here, and I want to make sure that it's right. I don't want to go around um, copying code if, there's, if, if I had a typo in it. So, I'm going to go save this and look at this. Now when I put my mouse over this image, the image changes to that. Now, the other two, nothing happens because I haven't coded that yet. But I do know at the very least, when this page loads up, it loads up with this guy in there originally. If I put my mouse on it, then it changes it to that one. So now I can go and duplicate this code for the other images, for the other thumbnail images. And if I put my mouse over the first one, I want the thumbnail or the image to change to one, to two, and to three. So there we go. We have this going on. Now, a couple of things that, that are confusing the students is the uses of the quotes. We have two sets of quotes that we can use. We have the double quote and the single quote. And that's a good thing because sometimes we have to put quotes inside of quotes. So the fact that we have the single quotes that we can use as quotes allows us to have the double quotes going around the outside of the entire JavaScript statement and the single quotes to be used within the statement. So, if you notice that all these HTML attributes say ID equals and then in double quotes you have the value of the ID. Here you have the value of the SRC, the value of the all. Same thing here. The double quotes go around the entire JavaScript statement from beginning to end. All right. 
So it's just like any other HTML attribute. On mouse over equals double quote, a bunch of stuff, a second double quote. All right. Now, within that JavaScript instruction, though, we can't use the double quotes again. Why not? Because if we use the double quotes here and here, the browser's going to think the JavaScript statement ended there, that it went from there to there. And that's not a complete JavaScript statement, and it would have no idea what the rest of the stuff was. So if we did that, it's not going to work. Because it sees the ending double quote as ending the JavaScript statement, which started here and goes to here. So we can use a single double quote, uh, so single quotes within the double quotes. What do we put in double quotes again? Uh, this takes a little getting used to, but essentially we put values of things in here. IMG swap is a name I created. It's a value I created for an ID. All right? It's not a part of an instruction. It's a value that I created. All right? And because of that, we want that exact, those exact letters are the value that I want to use. So because of that, it appears in quotes. Likewise, 1.jpg is also a value <coughs> that I want to use. It's not part of the instruction. It's not a variable or anything like that. So that will also be in quotes. So if we do that then we're working. We could make this work by clicking on it simply by changing on mouse over to on click. Alright, and then it would work the same. It, I agree that it probably doesn't matter all that much as long as uh, it is done consistently. There might be something about a particular problem that would lead me to say, well, I'd use a click event here, I'd use a mouse over here. I probably most of the time would use a mouse over because um, if you put your mouse over it, you'll immediately see that the image changed. Whereas if you use the on click, you're liable to think the page is broken if nothing happens when you put your mouse over it. You might not think to click. Probably a lot of users would, but... And I guess you could put an instruction on there to do that, but... Put like a hover on it? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely could do... You could do something like that, but... So it really isn't, isn't a huge difference one way or another. So in these two examples, the, the, or these couple of examples that we went over last time, the one thing I want to illustrate is that we have changed both stuff about the CSS and stuff about the HTML. So literally anything about the page we can change. We haven't done any examples yet, but you can actually add things to a page. You can add, um, you know, an, an additional picture to the page, or you could add a drop down to the page or you could add you could add stuff to the page if you wanted to um, for example uh, those of you that are on Facebook or on Gmail for example you notice that if you bring up your Gmail and you're sitting there watching it and you get a new you, you get a new email boom it pops up just like if you get a new uh, if someone makes a comment on your status uh, on Facebook that pops up immediately. There's actually JavaScript that actually adds paragraphs or list items or whatever the HTML code is that contains those things. So you can change the page really any way that you want to by either changing attributes that are already there, by deleting attributes that are there, or deleting elements that are there, or adding new ones. So in this course, we're just getting to the tip of the iceberg. We're just going to do some basic, simple things so that you understand the role and the contribution that JavaScript has to a web page. And then as you go on further, you can learn all sorts of cool things uh, how to do it. Any questions? All right. I'll go unlock the lab. I'll come back to grab my files, and then I'll be back over.